West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Thank you all for joining me. Eugene, I want to start with you. The New York Times writes, quote, the fighting in Ukraine has disrupted global oil markets, sending gas prices and inflation in the United States soaring and pushed aside longer term issues that Biden had long hoped would become the centerpiece of his legacy. How is the White House working to balance the U.S. response to the war with Biden's domestic agenda here at home? It's a struggle, right? Because they put together this coalition to help Ukraine. So they have to concentrate on that. The president has to continue to talk about that. The administration has to continue to work on that. But this is an administration that had high hopes for the domestic agenda, right? You talk about their Build Back Better agenda. I'm not sure what it's called anymore, but their social spending agenda, the kinds of things they wanted to do here. And so there is a little bit of a, they would say they're chewing gum and walking at the same time, but the focus on it is obviously personally or professionally frontwards what people can see is ukraine and you have americans hurting and they know that so you're gonna see i'm told by a white house official today as president biden goes out more talking about this that he is going to one um show people in their eyes that he's competent and he you know he has his hands at the wheel um he feels their pain and more importantly he's going to push for things to be um passed that will help them right because voters are at this point thinking what have you done for me lately it's great that you had did the arp and COVID. Funds. It's great that there's there was an infrastructure bill, but what are you going to do next? And that's what the administration has to focus on. Well, Mariana, Mariana to, to, let's talk about what used to be called Build Back Better for a second. I mean, what elements of Biden's Build Back Better agenda have the best shot at getting through the Senate this summer or fall? Yeah, it's definitely not called Build Back Better simply because it's kind of become the boogeyman term for many Democrats that reflects that intra-party fight that we saw all last year. And really, you ask, what are the policies? Well, it comes down to Senator Joe Manchin because he was the one who, of course, said, I can't support the bill that passed through the House that both moderates and progressives, through a lot of hard work and a lot of family infighting, finally were able to fund a number of proposals, a number of promises that Democrats for years had been saying, this is what we're going to deliver. These are our priorities for our party, for our voters and for Americans at large. So what Manchin has said he would support are things like prescription drugs. That's something that affects uh, even conservative districts, uh, something that has bipartisan support on the Hill, even though we haven't seen much action on that front. He's also called and and supported a number of climate reform provisions. Uh, Something else is also tax breaks for 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 a number of Americans, especially not the wealthy. He actually goes further than Senator Kirsten Sinema on that front because he actually wants to repeal the 2017 Trump tax cuts while she has been a little bit more cautious on that front. So those are 
many things where Democrats can agree with and they really much understand doesn't matter if you're a moderate, if you're a progressive, that you have to get something done and it's going to be much more narrow in scope. Well, let's let's drill down on, on one issue in particular. The White House keeps kicking student loan forgiveness, student loan forgiveness down the road with the pause on payments set to expire just two months before the midterms. Where do things stand with canceling student loan debt, Mariana? Yeah, you know, this has been a very tricky issue. When I covered Biden, when he was running for president, it was definitely something that came up a lot. And and he even said, I don't know if I can just cancel student debt through an executive order. He's always been pretty wary about when to use executive orders. But it, it, it is definitely an issue that, especially for progressives, they're pushing him to just cancel it at some point or at least lessen the amount that is due back. It is pretty significant that he has actually listened to a number of Democrats who have said you need to at least extend this pause. What he does after the midterms will be interesting. I'm sure it'll depend on the state of the economy as well. And Eugene, with Biden focused on Ukraine, the White House has deployed Vice President Harris to rural areas of the Deep South. Talk to us about that strategy and what message the vice president is sending with these visits. Yeah, because it's about her focusing on all of the things that the administration um, has her doing, right? Uh, going to Poland and and Romania, um, making calls for um, the Supreme Court justice um, confirmation hearings. But at the same time, and this is coming from her, is what her aides tell me, is that she is constantly trying to find ways to make more Amer- Americans come to the table, right? And so instead of just going to Philly, which she also did, or going to Columbus, Ohio, she also also has gone to Greenville, Mississippi. She has also gone to Sunset, Louisiana, which I bet a lot of viewers had never heard of, pushing some of the things that the administration has worked on, talking about rural broadband, talking about um, the lead and pipes around this country. And so what they are telling us, the strategy that has continued, it started in the White House, right? Like she went before COVID, during COVID, excuse me, when she would have people come to the office, these constituencies that folks hadn't really spoken to in a long time and now she's able to take that voice to the people and do that and I think one of the interesting things is you know the Cedric Richmond a senior advisor to the president he said we know we're not going to win Louisiana or win Mississippi per se but this is about letting more Americans know that hey you're a part of this conversation and they want to diversify the folks that they're talking about um, and talking to over and over throughout her time as vice president. All right, Mariana, in about the minute and a half that that we have left, a new Quinnipiac University poll found just one in four Hispanic voters approves of the job that President Biden is doing. What could these numbers mean for Democrats in the 2022 midterms? Well, it can mean a lot in the midterms and also in the long run. You know, Democrats, I should say Hispanic voters have largely voted with Democrats, and it still is a reliable base for the party. But... I know you have heard this. I have heard this for a while, too, from strategists who have been talking to Democrats for a long time about how to solidify the base. And it is just showing up where they are and talking about the issues that matter most to them. A lot of assumption is that immigration is the issue that matters to your community, to my community. It actually is just what everyone else is feeling, and that is the economy. So they're very much feeling the pinch in their own pockets, in their own homes. And like everyone well, everyone else wants to know what Biden is doing. But Democrats, you know, it has long been a criticism that they need to do a lot more. And Republicans have been making inroads, just showing up in, in certain parts of Florida and Texas, as I'm, I, I know you know. Um, and they, while they're not making significant gains yet, they're really looking at how they can win over Hispanic voters to solidify and be part of the Republican Party. It is Monday, the 18th of April of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is River City Hash Mondays. It's the day after Easter Sunday. Uh Uh-huh. And, of course, we know that Passover and Ramadan continue. And we might as well call it the holiday season because, as far as I'm concerned, 
Easter's not over until the Orthodox churches celebrate it. And that's, I believe, on the 29th this year. So uh, stay tuned for that. <laughs> yeah. Is there going to be a fight between the Ukrainian Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox? Because you know the, the Ukrainian Orthodox is actually the original church there in Russia. And the Russian Orthodox was a splinter off of <laughs> the Ukrainian one. And so somehow, uh, you know, they get to take the name with them. And that way, Ukraine does not exist. They don't have a history. Wow, they want to disappear a whole culture. Is that genocide? <laughs> I think so. You just got to be careful about uh, when you can legally apply it, apparently. Huh? All right. Well, uh... It looks like Vlad continues his belligerent uh, stance to the world. And I don't know. What's happening in France right now is by turn scary and heartening. Tens of thousands of French citizens have taken to the streets in opposition to Marine Le Pen, who, by the way, just got charged by the EU uh, representative of their legal uh, wing for embezzlement. She got charged by the EU for embezzlement. Apparently, a lot of right-wing politicians and their staff um, utilize EU funds for nefarious reasons Uh, Other than, (laughs) if you want to say what they were actually contracted to have the money for, could be nefarious on on just that point. But no, we're talking about even more nefarious uses of monies from the EU. So um, they don't like that. The EU has a very strong anti-corruption investigative unit because their whole purpose of being is to stop the rampant corruption with people who, I guess, have little moral grounding. You know, it's always the ones who say they are the most Christians that tend to, shall we say, be tempted to do, you know, gross wrongdoing at the expense of other people. Now, I know it's not just Christians, but I'm, you know, hey, it's Easter. Might as well point a finger at ourselves, huh? Might as well. So, uh, which which brings me to another point. Does the modern day American Christian not believe in one God? Because apparently they think there's like all sorts of gods out there. I is is this from um, <laughs> bad translations from Greek and Aramaic into Latin and every other vernacular? Huh? I don't know. Could be. Well, <laughs> we could we could discuss the metaphysical aspects of what it means to have all of these different religions. But since there's politics involved, we'll just uh, continue on that. So, um, uh, yeah, the Marine Le Pen uh, charged with embezzlement just days before this runoff election against Macron. Tens of thousands have taken to the streets in opposition to her and uh, the National Front in general, uh, she has been uh, making public proclamations that when she becomes the president or, well, the head of France, what position is she going for? And she will uh, pretty much get her, her, or she will pretty much get France out of NATO. Where have we heard that before? And uh, she's dear, good friends with Vladimir Putin. So it just stands to reason, uh, you know, Vlad's Vlad's got something on her. And she's taking the money from Vlad. So we'll see. Uh, She said that uh, she will enforce the headscarf ban on Muslim women. Well, that's giving a woman a choice. Jeez. I guess it's not. Uh, A vote for Marine Le Pen is a vote against women. And we're not talking just Muslim women because they will be forced to take the scarf off. 
Marine Le Pen is a right wing white nationalist. And when it gets down to it, they also want to tell people who and when they can have sex. Yeah. You think it's just about abortion? Oh, no. It's about sex. Because these repressed assholes are just doing the most kinkiest BS you can think of. And they think that if they're doing it because they're such good people and they're doing this depravity, think about all those lessers out there and the depraved behaviors they're doing. (laughs) Yeah, well, let me tell you, (laughs) your depravity is pretty singular. Okay, when they start talking about furries and then Don Jr. took takes out an Easter video with armed bunnies. Who is really a furry? I thought something was going on between he and you know who. Oh, God. Now, we had to experience her when Gavin was mayor. And she was so bad. Think about that. She was so bad that he had to get rid of her and go with the Scientology lady. Yeah, Siebel Scientology. Just saying. Just saying. (sighs) It's got to be pretty bad. And it is. And it was. So, uh, lap dances for, you know, at uh, donor uh, events. Well, well, I don't know. I, I can't imagine Jill Biden... Or anybody. Yeah, I just I just can't I can't imagine it. First of all, doing it, and second of all, getting away with it. No, there would be a special prosecutor involved, and I think Daryl Issa would be leading the committee. Even if he's in the minority, it doesn't matter. They don't care. Without any evidence, yeah, this came across the transom too. Daryl Issa wants to open up a special prosecutor department to investigate Joe Biden. For what? Just do it. We gotta. We're running the Hillary playbook. 2016 all over again. But his, e- his kids' emails on the laptop. You put the emails there, mofo! Even the blind uh, computer shop owner who somehow has surfaced resurfaced and I still don't know if you're blind eh, there's more to the story than we know but nonetheless yeah he he was complaining that uh, they were trying to put stuff on the computer and when I mean they I mean you know so he was concerned about the integrity of what was going on I still don't understand how the guy came into possession of Hunter's laptop from, what, Malibu? All the way out there in Timbuktu on the East Coast? In some rural area? Come on. Sounds like something Roger Stone would do. Because it's so preposterous, it's like poking us in the eye, and then they laugh. Here. We're going to concoct a story and poke you in the eye, and then we're going to laugh, and you have to live with it. And we do! (laughs) God. I don't know. Also, I am tired of letting the repug uh, fifth columnists, who are also elected, so they're insurgents, let's be clear, determining what the frame is. We can't call Joe's economic package Build Back Better anymore because that's supposed to cause people to be triggered. You know what triggers me? When somebody tells me there's a trigger warning. You know, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy then. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trigger you by telling you there's a trigger coming up. <laughs> Come on. It's going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. No, it's going to hurt me. All you're going to get is a red hand when you slap me. Come on, stop it. I am tired of that. We just give up so easily. Why are we so gutless? Do we need to tan our balls? Jeez. Tucker. (laughs) I still don't understand how Tucker Carlson thinks that he's the arbiter of what masculinity is. Yeah, I made mention that of uh, that uh, production that he Tucker Carlson originals. Yeah, that's original. Uh, I, I've seen more homoerotic films 
and and, and clips from Tucker Carlson in the last two weeks than I saw for really a decade or more when I lived uh, lower hate uh, Castro area, you know, sort of like in between the, the two. You could walk too, you know, you had to cross a hill, but it was actually quite a nice place. All that time I lived there, I never experienced that much homoeroticism. And I lived right in the area. I mean, you went to the Castro Theater. Now, granted, the Castro Theater wasn't known for showing just gay films. They were known for being a movie palace. But I'm telling you, I think of all the movies I saw, I mean, Blue Velvet, Jesus. Uh, what else? I, you know, just any number of movies at the Castro Theater. I never saw any amount of homoeroticism there that I saw from Tucker Carlson. And he's supposed to be the arbiter of masculinity. I'm telling you. Just because you're gay doesn't mean you're not masculine. Well, I'll just say this. I don't look at uh, Tucker Carlson as being a guy walking around with, you know, just chaps during uh, some festival in the Castro. Do they do that anymore? I think that I think the Castro became gentrified. So I yeah. I don't think I don't think the Castro is what we used to think of it fondly. But anyway, these people take the message and they twist it around determine it upon their own culpability to do the wrong thing. And then project all of that onto everybody else as if we are taking part in it also. And they think that if we give in or we're silent about it, well, that means we're complicit. And you know what? It does mean that. Why do we give it up so easily? Hmm? Because we got to find some way to compromise with a bunch of Nazis are going to stab us in the back anyway. Please. Almost 50% of the textbooks in Florida that deal with math, geometry, trig, calculus were turned away because somewhere hidden in them is CRT. <laughs> Which just goes to prove that the basic premise of critical race theory is that racism is so imbued in our society and our culture and our government and our laws that a government official in the form of a governor can unilaterally, oh yeah, he had his little committee, but pretty much unilaterally get rid of a bunch of math, uh, calculus, trig, algebra books. Because of the fear of critical race theory that they have brainwashed their base into believing? I think it has more to do with an anti-intellectual bent to make the electorate so stupid that they want authoritarianism to tell them what to do because they don't know what to do to begin with. used to be against the law to teach a slave to read. Why was that? Because you don't want someone that you're taking advantage of to know of their condition. And that's what an education does. It makes you aware of your condition. All right. Don't talk to me about originalism anymore, you Nazis. I'm serious. You take our laws and you twist them around and use it against us. And they have dark money groups going after every Biden nominee. And that doesn't register a blip in the media. Mike Lee uh, exposed as being so intimately involved in the overthrow of our government. His name was not mentioned once on the Sunday shows. Not once. How many times will we hear Hunter's name, though? And we, when they say Hunter, we don't even hear it anymore. It's so stupid. It's preposterous on its on the surface. 
But you already have uh, the kids of a particular authoritarian figure with fake uh, uh, orange skin. <laughs> and a really bad do also. Who already have been sanctioned legally that they can't run a charity anywhere in the United States because they're crooked. And Daryl Issa wants to open up a special prosecutor office to investigate Joe Biden. For what? Nothing. Because they are so deep into the destruction of these United States. They are fifth columnists and worse. They are colluding with a hostile foreign government to bring the United States of America to its knees. 163 Republicans voted against aid to Ukraine. If I was the FBI, I would be investigating these people for why. And I know that you're not supposed to go after people for their politics. But when a hostile foreign power has declared war against us, and we have 163 possible elected members of our government on the far right who seem to have no problem with Vlad, who have actually been contacted by a Russian official who we have uh, an arrest warrant out for, given money, Influencing the politics of the United States? Fifth columnist? Do people even remember what that is anymore? Is it the pejorative that we wish or I wish it was? There's another term and that's called traitor. But apparently we can't call him traitor because we can't call someone a traitor when a hostile foreign power has declared war against us. Only when we reciprocate and declare war against them, we'll call it a police action. So anything that anybody does doesn't apply in terms of treason, apparently. Oh, my. Look at the time. It's Monday after a holiday weekend, and I'm just... I'm just... <laughs> You know what I'm just. All right, let's get into the curated part of the show. I've I've delayed it far enough, and it's actually uh, we we took some time over this holiday weekend to put a show together for you. So, what is in the curated part of the show? Of course, at the top, w the war in Ukraine looms over Biden's agenda, and is it our problem with messaging? Or is it how the message is delivered from the media? Yeah. That's something we got to think about. They're, they're whining that maybe Jen Psaki might have a position in the media to actually say what needs to be said. No wonder they don't want her on. All right. On the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, some state lawmakers are calling it quits because they can't afford to serve. Our system is so, so broken that, you know, it used to be that, uh, you know, every citizen was supposed to you know, actually serve as a representative. Yeah, that was what representative democracy w was meant to be. But now only the deep pocketed rich can afford it. Modest income buyers are being priced out of the new vehicle market. Mm -hmm. For the same reason, regular Joes and gals can't uh, serve because they can't afford to. And a container ship stuck for more than a mo month in Chesapeake Bay has finally been refloated from the same company that brought you the one that got went aground in the Suez. Hmm. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Swedes are fed up. With over three days of demonstrations across the Nordic nation by, a, get this, a Danish anti-immigrant group came to Sweden to rampage in the streets. And the Swedes are finally fed up. All right. And 
WNBA players say life in Russia was lucrative but lonely. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. At netrootsradio.com, to the right of the page is the chat room link. And the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. Across from that chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, please. We need the money because we pay our bills. Thank you for your generosity. And uh, I just got to reiterate, we need the money. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary, of course, on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. Get that linked up on Twitter and the other social media platforms, and you know who they are. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, really wherever podcasts can be found. And of course, just as a reminder, the deep archive of all the Netroots Radio Library can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org. Netroots Radio. Yeah, we're right there. Alrighty, this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays, is by Susan Haig out of the Associated Press. When trying to decide whether to seek a fourth term in the Connecticut House of Representatives, Representative Joe De La Cruz ran the question by his wife, whom he jokingly refers to as his lawyer and financial advisor. While Tammy De La Cruz did not want to discourage her 51-year-old husband from stepping away from the part-time job he has grown to love, she acknowledged it did not make financial sense for him to run again in November. The retirement planner in her didn't even have to use a calculator to do the math. Joe De La Cruz, a Democrat, told fellow House mem- members when he announced in February that he's not seeking re-election. The $30,000 a year we make to do this illustrious job, the one that we all really care for, is truly not enough to live on. It's truly not enough to retire on. Lawmakers in other states, often those with part-time citizen legislators, have raised similar complaints. In Oregon, where the base pay is about thirty-three grand a year, three female state representatives announced in March they are not seeking re-election because they cannot afford to support their families on a part-time salary for what's really full-time work. They call the situation unsustainable in a joint resignation letter. Connecticut legislators have not seen an increase in their $28,000 base pay in 21 years, while it varies by state to state as to how legislative salaries are adjusted, bills increasing legislator pay were proposed in several states this year, including Connecticut, Georgia, Oregon, and New Mexico, which is the nation's only unsalaried legislature. So far, the bills have faltered as some lawmakers fear rankling voters by approving their own pay raises. It's also not clear whether higher salaries ultimately led to more diversified legislators, something proponents of pay raises say is at risk. A 2016 study published in the American Political Science Review 
determined there was surprisingly little empirical evidence that raising politicians' salaries would encourage more working-class people to run for political office. They found that higher salaries don't seem to make political office more attractive to workers. They seem to make it more attractive to professionals who already earn high salaries so they can get some more. Arturo Vargas, CEO of the National Association of Association of Latino elected and appointed officials said he believes that low pay, coupled with threats and picketing some lawmakers and their families, have received over issues like COVID-19 rules, will discourage people of modest means from running, and that often means people of color. Reicher of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. Two years after the pandemic tore through the economy, America's auto market looks something like this. Prices are drastically up, supply is drastically down, and gasoline costs drastically more. The result? A widening disparity between the richest buyers and everyone else. The most affluent buyers keep plunking down big money for new vehicles, including the least fuel efficient among them, meaning trucks, SUVs and large sedans. As for the rest of America, millions are feeling increasingly priced out of the new vehicle market. They are competing instead for a shrunken supply of used autos, especially smaller, less expensive ones that consume less fuel. The jump in pump prices since Russia's invasion of Ukraine has only intensified their urge to keep costs down. Now, that's not so for the wealthier-than-average buyers who now dominate the new vehicle market. Those that can afford it are still buying what they want, Jeff Schuster, president of global forecasting for LMC Automotive Consulting Firm, said. Ivan Drury, a senior manager at Edmunds.com Autoside, has been surprised by the demand among affluent buyers for high-priced new vehicles. I cannot imagine a situation in which we've had so many people willing to spend so much money, Drury said. It's just abnormal for someone to go out and spend sticker price or above. I can't think of any other time period unless it was on specific models. And this is every car on the road. In other words, the rich are not like you and me. (laughs) They have more money to spend. Staff bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A container ship the length of more than three football fields has finally been pried from the muddy bottom of the Chesapeake Bay more than a month after it ran aground. After two unsuccessful attempts to dislodge it and the subsequent removal of roughly 500 of the 5,000 containers it was carrying, the ever forward was refloated just before 7 a.m. Sunday local time by two barges and five tugboats. 
A full moon and high spring tide helped provide a lift to the salvage vessels as they pulled and pushed the massive ship from the mud across a dredged hole and back into the shipping channel. Once we floated, the Ever Forward was weighed down again by water tanks to ensure safe passage under the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and then on its way to an anchorage off Annapolis. Marine inspectors will examine the ship's hull before the Coast Guard allows it to return to the port of Baltimore to retrieve the offloaded containers. The cargo ship, operated by Taiwan-based Evergreen Marine Corp., was traveling from Baltimore to Norfolk on uh, March 19th when it ran aground just north of the Chesapeake Bay. Officials said the grounding did not result in reports of injuries, damage, or pollution, and the Coast Guard has not said what caused the Ever Forward to run aground. The ship became stuck outside the shipping channel and did not block marine navigation, unlike last year's high-profile grounding in the Suez Canal of its sister vessel, the Ever Given. That incident disrupted ship traffic and the global supply chain for days. Oh, so that's where Abbott got the idea. All right, let's get to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, get your multiverse here. A recent trend in current cinema, first picked up in a big way by Marvel, has been a concept proposed by actual physicists, notably J.W. Dunn, that multiple universes may exist, branching off at decision points. While only a theory, one can barely imagine a more enticing idea for a movie maker. In the new and everything, everywhere, all at once, we get a modern, if mundane, story about a Chinese immigrant family who own, what else, but a laundromat. One that happens to be being audited by the IRS. However, the story is told in about as unconventional way as possible. To wit, when Evelyn Wang, Michelle Yeoh's character, her husband Waymond, and her father, the veteran James Hong, visit the IRS, Evelyn and her husband begin being contacted by their counterparts from other universes where our characters are differently situated. Evelyn's daughter, Joy, in the Alpha Universe is the evil Jobu Tupaki, with whom IRS agent Deandra, a hilariously made-up Jamie Lee Curtis, is in league. Alpha Waymond informs Evelyn that, as the greatest failure of all the Evelyns, she's seen as the greatest hope to defeat Jobu Tupaki, who wants to destroy all the multiverses with a black hole in the shape of a bagel. Got the idea? And as the characters can learn skills and interact in other universes, particularly Yo's Evelyn, gets to exhibit her martial arts skills, experience a reality where people have hot dogs for fingers, and meet a chef with a rocket-like raccoon friend. The Daniels, as they're called, Dan Kwan and Dan Scheinert, directed everything, everywhere, all at once, and it's choreographed and edited from their own tight script into a hilarious frenzy which is not to be missed. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Heart disease and stroke can be catastrophic. They're leading causes of death, disability, and healthcare spending in the U.S., yet they're largely preventable. Alarmingly, heart disease and stroke are taking a toll on middle-age adults 35 to 64, with over 800,000 deaths and hospitalizations in 2016. Million Hearts is a national initiative focused on preventing 1 million heart attacks, strokes, and other cardiovascular events by 2022. Coordinated actions by Million Hearts partners in communities, healthcare, and public health will keep people healthy, 
optimize care, and improve outcomes in populations at risk. Everyone has a part to play. Focus on the ABCs of heart health. A. Aspirin use when appropriate. B. Blood pressure control. C. Cholesterol management. And S. Smoking cessation. To learn more, visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Ralph Waldo Emerson told about a guest who came to dinner and spent the entire evening prattling about his own integrity. The louder he talked of his honor, Emerson wrote, the faster we counted our spoons. Today, America has not one but six guests in our national home babbling about their integrity. They are the six extremist Republican judges who now control our Supreme Court, and it's a bit unsettling to hear them go on and on, almost frantically pleading with us to believe in their judicial impartiality. For example, the court's newest member, Amy Coney Barrett, suddenly blurted out at a public forum in September that, quote, this court is not comprised of a bunch of partisan hacks. Whoa, better count our spoons. In fact, each of the six were installed on the court by right-wing Republicans specifically because they had proven to be devout partisan hacks. Interestingly, Barrett made her unprompted and strained assertion of judicial integrity at the McConnell Center, named for Mitch McConnell, the rabidly partisan GOP senator who pulled a fast one last year, rushing Barrett onto the bench on a party-line vote just before the Republicans lost control of the Senate. Indeed, old Mitch himself introduced Barrett at the forum where she gave her we-are-not-partisan hacks speech. He grinned proudly at the pure hackery of his partisan protege. This is Jim Hightower saying, another hardcore partisan on the court, Sam Alito, whined in October that critics accused the court's GOP majority of being, quote, a dangerous cabal that resorts to sneaky and improper methods to get its way. Well, golly, Sam, yes, we do think that. Because again and again, you partisans sneak up on the Constitution and we the people to twist the law to fit your political bias and personal whims. If you don't want to be considered political hacks, stop being political hacks. The right to reproductive choice is in grave danger. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. A half century ago, in Roe v. Wade, a decision affirmed many times since, the Supreme Court made clear that women have a fundamental constitutional right, a liberty interest, in making the highly personal decision whether or not to terminate a pregnancy. But now, the Supreme Court, based not on any change in law or any change in relevant facts, appears poised to turn back the clock to a time when politicians and state governments ruled over women, their bodies, and choice. In anticipation of the Supreme Court's decision this term that would gut or reverse Roe in the case now pending, many state legislatures have passed laws to prohibit abortions, some after 15 weeks, some after six, and many to prohibit abortion in those states altogether. With no exception for rape, really none, and no exception for incest, really none. The underlying premise is the government knows best. The government should control women in their bodies, and the government's power to decide should be absolute. The upcoming Supreme Court decision could well prove to be a watershed moment in our history, ushering in a period when the federal courts no longer will hold themselves out as a defender of individual rights, but rather as the protector of governmental power. These are, to say the least, scary times. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two.
You have more than likely heard of Rosa Parks and how she heroically sat down on a bus to help end segregation in Montgomery, Alabama. But did you know discrimination often barred black bus drivers, even in northern cities? On this day in labor history, the year was 1941, and New York City bus companies took an important step in fighting discrimination on the job. The bus companies agreed to hire 200 black bus drivers and mechanics. Reverend Adam Clayton Powell Jr. had led a four-week boycott of the bus companies. The bus boycott was not Powell's first battle for hiring equality in the city. In 1938, the Reverend Powell Jr. had followed in his father's footsteps to become the pastor of the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem. The charismatic pastor used his status to call for civil rights reforms. He helped lead Don't Buy Where You Can't Work campaigns in an effort to open up quality employment opportunities for black New Yorkers. Similar campaigns took place in other northern cities, including Cleveland and Chicago. Perhaps Reverend Powell's campaign that garnered the most attention came in 1939, where he led a picket to the Empire State Building to protest discriminatory hiring practices at the World's Fair. The eyes of the globe were on New York City due to the fair, and the Reverend understood it was an excellent opportunity to publicly make the case to end employment discrimination. His strategy was successful. The number of black employees for the fair more than triple. Two years later, the bus boycott was another part of the long campaign to end hiring discrimination. In 1944, Powell was elected the first black congressman from New York. Today, a statue of Reverend Adam Clayton Powell Jr. stands in Harlem. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America where it is currently 38 degrees Fahrenheit expecting a high in the mid 50s or possibly a little less. Cloudy with occasional rain during the afternoon with uh, winds out of the south-southwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour, bringing with it about half an inch and then cloudy with showers overnight, lows in the upper 30s, bringing with it about a quarter of an inch of rain, and then rain tomorrow early and uh, with uh, showers in the afternoon, winds out of the south-southwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour, and that will bring with it another quarter inch of rain. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon have not been updated from over the weekend. So we currently stand at 427,055 confirmed cases with 524 confirmed deceased. Grass pollen is rated high outside the window here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is good at 27 parts per million, and that daytime UV index has ticked up once again in the moderate range to level 5. Barometric pressure is falling at 29.92 inches. Visibility is up to 9 miles, and relative humidity is at 99%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 63 and fair. Paris is 68 and sunny. Rome is 70 degrees and sunny. Kiev is 43 and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 55 and cloudy. Hong Kong is 70 degrees and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 55 and cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 68 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 48 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is 50 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. 
and that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Associated Press staff bring us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Swedish police say they fired warning shots during a riot in an eastern city to disperse protesters angry about demonstrations over the past several days by a Danish anti Islam group in Sweden. Three people were slightly injured during the clashes. A crowd of about 150 people threw stones at officers and police vehicles, set fire and set fire to cars. Police said they responded by firing warning shots and three people, quote, seemed to have been hit by ricochets, end quote, and were hospitalized in Norrköping, which has around 130,000 residents and is about 100 miles southwest of Stockholm. A fo- photographer for Swedish news agency TT at the scene reported that several riot police officers were seen carrying a wounded man to an ambulance. The riot broke out following Danish far-right politician Rasmus Paladin's meetings and planned Quran burnings in various Swedish cities and towns since Thursday. Paladin and his Stromkurs party had planned a demonstration in Norkoping on Sunday yesterday, but he never showed up in the city. Unrest was also reported in the nearby city of Linkoping. Je te donne mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Doug Feinberg of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. For the elite athletes in the WNBA, spending the offseason playing in Russia can mean earning more money than they can make back home, sometimes even two or three times as much. But those who have done that also describe the loneliness of being away from family and friends, of struggling with an unfamiliar language and culture, and of living in a place with only a few hours of sunlight in the winter and temperatures well below freezing. Brittany Griner is one of those players who went to Russia in recent years to earn extra money. For the two-time Olympian, however, it has turned into a prolonged nightmare. Since arriving at a Moscow airport in mid-February, she has been detained by police after they reported finding vapor cartridges allegedly containing cannabis oil in her luggage. Still in jail, she is awaiting trial next month on charges that could bring up to 10 years in prison. Her arrest came at a time of heightened political tensions over Ukraine. Since then, Russia has invaded Ukraine. Ukraine and remains at war. A half dozen American players contacted by the AP shared their experiences on playing in Russia. Although none found themselves in the same situation as Griner, they described difficulties such as isolation and boredom apart from basketball. In the early 2000s, top WNBA players can earn about 125 grand a year as part of a marketing deal with the league. Today, the salary for elite players is about 500000 
By playing in Russia, those players can earn another one million to one and to one and a half million. Players say the Russian teams try to make them as comfortable as possible, including sometimes providing drivers and translators. The clubs also give players extra days off during breaks, knowing they have longer travel back to the U.S. if they go home. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know that Roots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver